1 Corinthians chapter 9, 18 verses this morning. Would you read along with me, please? Paul is writing. He says, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Even though I may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Now this is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. Don't we have the right to food and drink? Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, and as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas? Or is it only I and Barnabas who must work for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk? Do I say this merely from a human point of view? Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, Do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us, because the plowman plows and the thresher threshes, they ought to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? But we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that those who work in the temple get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar uh, share in what's offered on the altar? In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. Here's the key. But I have not used any of these rights, and I'm not writing this in the hope that you will do such things for me. I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of this boast. Yet when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, for I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I preach not the gospel of God. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily... I'm simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge and so not make use of my rights in preaching it. Father, this is a very personal portion of Scripture for those of us here at Calvary Chapel. Evidently, we're one of those rare people that you ask to do things for free. And Lord, we love the fact that you've entrusted us with this ministry. Over the years, there's been times when it's been so hard. And yet, as you walk through us through those difficult times, we learn more about who you are. All of that to say this, Lord, give us your heart today for the people of God, for the work of God, for reaching out to minister to others. Jesus, help us to love you more than we've ever loved you before. Share your heart. Give it to us that we may bring you honor and glory. Finally, Father, if there's even one here, if they don't know you, if they're not yet born again, this service, the two services that will follow, if they don't yet know you, ask them to be yours and add to your family for your glory. We pray these things in the most beautiful of all names. His name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Free, it's a funny thing. You know, we've been doing this now for 26 years, as all of you know, but, but it just, it sometimes seems so weird, at least it does, especially to other people. The problem with free is that there's just part of our fallen human nature that says, well, if, if something is free, then it doesn't have any value. 
Well, Jesus' death for us was free. It cost us nothing, but it cost him everything. And in our particular study in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 that we've arrived at this morning, it means so much to us. We have the opportunity here at Calvary Chapel to be a blessing to others, and we say we're doing it only for the glory of God. Nobody's getting rich here. Nobody's charging you for stuff here. We're doing it for free, and it is my prayer you will recognize the value, not only in what we do, but but the value in the ministry that we are also privileged to be a part of together. One more thought before getting into the study. You know, Paul says something that we ought to be able to say. In fact, we ought to be eager to say it every day. Follow me as I follow Christ. Or follow my example as I follow Christ. And too often we humans, you know, we think, well, that would be so arrogant. I don't want anybody to follow me. No, no, you follow Jesus. We think it sounds so spiritual. Every one of us ought to be able to say to everybody in our sphere of influence, you watch my life, you do what I do, because I'm following Jesus. And everybody you know ought to be able to find their way to Jesus just by following you around. Well, the Apostle Paul is the standard bearer in our study this morning. Chapter 9, incidentally, is a bad chapter division. It's just a continuation of what we've been studying in chapter 8. Paul says, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Even though I may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Now, it may appear at first glance that Paul is changing the subject, but remember the subject is still from last chapter where the context is sacrificing your freedom, your liberties for the benefit of others. We don't want to cause anybody else to stumble by what we do. So when it comes to to, to exercising our liberty or causing somebody else to stumble, we'll always forfeit our right, our freedom, in order to be a blessing to others. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying in this chapter. And he establishes immediately sort of his credentials. I'm free. I I can eat meat, is what he's saying. The meat from chapter 8 in the marketplace. I can do that, but why do I want to do it if it might cause someone to stumble? And then he sort of establishes credentials. Am I not an apostle? This is an apostle in the capital A sense, that, that peculiar calling. He says, have I not seen Jesus our Lord? That's one of the qualifications of being an apostle. When you run into other people in other churches and say, well, I'm an apostle, I'm an apostle, so-and-so, ask them, well, when did you see Jesus? And this isn't talking about a vision or in dream or in our imagination. This is a personal appearance of Jesus Christ for three years. In the wilderness of Arabia, Paul was visited regularly by Jesus, and Jesus was his teacher. Pretty good teaching credentials, don't you think? So I'm free. I could do what I want. I have the authority to to do what I want and tell you to do what I want, but I'm not going to exercise that authority. I've seen Jesus. My authority is established by the work that's happened in your midst, he's telling the Corinthians. In other words, I, I know I'm apostle because I see the fruit that comes from your life. One of the best things about what I do here at Calvary Chapel of San Antonio is that I get to watch your lives change so much. And I get to see you grow in the, in the knowledge of God, in the knowledge of God's will. I get to see you grow in love. And somebody can look at me and say, well, what makes you think you're called to be the pastor? All, all I have to do is point to you guys. You're sort of my calling card, my credentials. Well, Paul is saying the same thing. And then he's defending his ministry. It's an amazing thing that he even has to defend it. But what he's saying is, look, even though others may question my credentials, surely not you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. You know, Paul, it seemed, couldn't win. I, I, I said it a moment ago, but, but it amazes me that Paul had to defend his ministry. The miraculous powers that attended his work, the, the, the authority with which he taught, 
the miracles that validated that authority, the work that God had done in his heart, who he used to be and now who he was, everybody knew this was a man that was a rock star in the ancient world. He was famous. There were some. And there's always going to be trouble in the church. There's always going to be division. But there were some who would say, well, you know, he's not really an apostle. And in this particular case, the, the open door for attacking him is, well, you know, he doesn't get paid like the other apostles. He doesn't take money like the other. If, if God is blessing somebody, well, then they're not going to work with their hands. In, in the Greek culture in particular, doing menial work, doing work with your hands was considered degrading. Oh, he wouldn't do that. No, he's holy. Even now, we look at people who are supposedly holy men of God, and we think there's something different about them, something special. That's what made Paul so valuable as a tent maker, somebody who paid his own way. And believe it or not, that was the door that they were using to attack him. It was almost as though he couldn't win. So he says, this is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. Don't we have the right to food and drink? Now, I want to remind you, as we get through the first part of this chapter, that Paul is talking about sacrificing his rights. We Christians, especially here in America, we're really big on exercising our rights. Paul is saying, look, I've got the rights to do all these things. But remember, the punchline, we've already read it as we read through the, the, the verses this morning, is he's not going to use any of those rights. Don't we have the right to food and drink? Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas? That's Peter, of course. Now, for me personally, this is interesting information that we don't get anywhere else. It means that James and Jude, the Lord's half-brothers, were married. Peter was married. He had a wife. And they were also the family supported through the ministry that they performed. And Paul's saying, well, well, they can do it. Well, we can do it as well. And then he says, or is it only I and Barnabas? Now remember, this is the same man who sold land in the early church and brought it in and laid it at the feet of the apostles and with the right heart honored God. Or is it only I and Barnabas who must work for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk? Now, I know pastors, and I've never been in this situation, but I know pastors who do what I do and also work full-time jobs. It is so difficult. It's an amazing thing. They've got families to raise. They've got, they've got a marriage to, 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 to sustain, a marriage that is vital to how they perform their ministries. And yet they're also working 40 plus hour weeks because they've got to provide for their family. I can't even imagine how difficult it is for them. Now Paul's point is that sometimes that's what we have to do. And Paul teaches us that some of the workers for the kingdom of God deserve reward for their work whenever possible. And then he adds in verse 8, do I say this merely from a human point of view? Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Warren Wiersbe, who is now with the Lord, wrote this. He said, since oxen can't read, this verse was not written for them. And in the first century church, there was always that, that I'm, well, of course you need to, to feed your oxen while they're treading out the grain. Otherwise, they're not going to have the energy and the strength to do it. And, and basically, Paul's saying, God doesn't care about oxen. He's talking about you and he's talking about me. Verse 10 says, surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yet this was written for us. Because when the plowman plows and the thresher threshes, they ought to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. Now, there is a move uh, among Christian social media 
calling on pastors to work for free. Go get a job, support yourself, and then dispense the gospel for free. Paul is saying, no way, that's not what God indicates is his desire at all. So let me spend a few minutes, and this is one of those wonderful passages of Scripture that we can remember the context and also apply it to the things going on in our church culture some 2,000 years later. So I'm going to talk about pastor's pay. I should get paid more. <laughs> a lot more. Okay, now you know I'm kidding. Pastors should get paid we need to support our families, but it's how we get paid and the amount we get paid that's always the topic of discussion. This is where you'd expect a pastor to talk about how hard he works and how much he sacrifices and, and, and thus I, I deserve this or I deserve that. Well, I'm not going to do any of that. And the reason I'm not going to do any of that is because I'm already the highest paid guy in the United States of America. I am the richest man on the face of the earth. Now, I don't get paid hardly anything. But that's not the point. The point is the honor and the privilege of doing what I do, of having you guys call me pastor, to, to be able to, to, to open God's word. For me, it's three times a week and then sometimes more in the pastor's classes and other places. But for me to be able to do that is a privilege and, and I wouldn't sacrifice it for any amount of money in the world at all. We, Paula and I, we lack absolutely nothing. We live modestly. All of the pastors and their families here on staff live modestly. And the reason we do it is because we feel like God is already overpaying us. So how should a pastor live? At what standard? Well, we need to remember first and foremost that we as pastors are servants and we're to live like servants. It doesn't mean that we're to live in poverty. That's the point Paul is making here. But we should never, at the church's expense, live above the standard means of the people that we minister to. Now, from a worldly perspective, we could start thinking, well, well why didn't I get called to Newport Beach, California? Or I could have been a pastor in Beverly Hills. But see, that's beside the point. Wherever it is that we're called to serve, we should be living at a standard of living that is about the median range of the people that we serve. Not higher, not lesser, but about that median range. Now here's a promise from me, your pastor. No man serving here at Calvary Chapel of San Antonio will ever live an extravagant lifestyle. I promise you that. And by the way, you're free to ask any of them, are you living an extravagant lifestyle? They'll tell you they work for me. <laughs> and that's simply not the case. Listen to what Adam Clark says. He's a really old-time commentator. His commentaries are available on every uh, uh, PC study Bible program or, or the uh, Blue Letter Bible. Adam Clark. And, and this was before they had to worry about being socially or politically correct. Listen to this. The minister who takes more than is sufficient is a covetous hireling. He who obliges the church of God to support him and minister to his luxury, his avarice, and ambition is a monster for whom the human language has not yet got a name. Lighten up, Adam. <laughs> I mean, seriously, think about that. Now, if, if, if we say things like that today, people say, oh, well, you're not loving. You don't understand. God wants me to have this. And, and, and we really do. We pastors have this struggle. When I go to pastor's conferences, I am sitting with people that make a half million to a million dollars a year because they have big churches and they can afford it. And I'm thinking, Adam Clark, what would you say about that? Our job is to be a sacrifice but it's also not to put us at a level of poverty. Now we've, for 26 years, here at Calvary Chapel of San Antonio, we've never had enough money. And the reason we don't have enough money is because we do everything here for free, everything. And we're gonna talk about that as we get to the end of the Bible study today. But I want you to realize that regardless of the level of pay, what we're able to do here, Pastor Ken, I love him so much, he keeps telling me, I have the best job in the world. 
And, and I say, well, no, I do because I got you. And, but, but the idea is we've just got this wonderful opportunity that God has given us, and it is a delight to do it. And the honest truth is if we could, we would do it for free. So we do the next best thing. We get as close to free as possible. And we do it, and the Lord rewards us. That's what being a servant of God is really all about. And the Apostle Paul is talking about his rights. Now, he's arguing this case like a lawyer. The whole book of Romans is a perfect legal argument. Well, he's arguing his case here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 as though he's presenting a legal case and he's just made the legal case that because of who he is, because of what he's called to do, he has the right to do anything that anybody else can do and perhaps even more. But remember, we're getting to the punchline. He's not exercising those rights. He says, if we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? I think the principle is pretty simple here. If we receive spiritual blessings from people, we ought then to be eager to share our material blessings with them. We're expressing that the value of what they offer us is equal to the value of what we work hard for. I've had a lot of interesting discussions with young idealistic pastors over the years as they struggle about when it's time to go full-time in ministry. You know, I just don't know if our church can afford it, and we, we really have to be careful, and I don't want to be a burden on the church. And all of that sounds so spiritual, but my counsel to them is always the same. I believe that you are a burden to your church if you're not available to them. And so the first thing your church needs is a pastor who's able to minister to them, a pastor who's able to study the Word and spend time walking and talking with Jesus and getting direction and vision from the Lord. And that's why it's important. Every church, now remember what I said earlier, the median average, every church with 10 different families in it. If you had 10 families, 20 people, 20 adults, Every church that size can support a pastor. And every church that size and beyond needs to have a pastor be available to them. So Paul is simply saying, this is the process. Is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? But we did not use this right. I set it aside. I had the right to do it, but because I love you, because I love what I'm called to do, I didn't use this right. Now, this is where we get to the real heart of the Apostle Paul. Now, most people don't think of 1 Corinthians 9 as, as really exposing his heart, but I think this and Romans chapter 9, the first four verses, tell us more about the heart of this man, the Apostle Paul, than any other passages in Scripture. In Romans chapter 9, he says, look, I'd give my place in heaven for the, for, for if only my brothers, the Jews, would believe. That, that's a, a man who is praying for people who are trying to kill him. And he says, and he does it with a triple-layered oath. I tell you the truth. I am not lying. The Holy Spirit bears witness. And then he says he would give his place in heaven. Now, I love you with all of my heart but I'm not that spiritual. <laughs> I want to be with Jesus. Now, I want to be that spiritual, but that's his heart. And here what he's saying is, look, I've got the right to do what everybody else does. When people would look at the Apostle Paul, and this is hard for us to imagine, but, but they were critical of him. He wasn't impressive in appearance. Uh, he'd been beaten so many times. He was a hunchback. His nose had been literally splattered all over his face. He'd been in the stock so many times, his legs were, were bow-legged, and, and, and he was just always in pain. He had this gook coming out of his eyes. There was nothing impressive about him. And people were using that against him. More impressive people. People that were a little more fiery in their speaking style would come in and say, well, I know Paul said this, but, but look at Paul's life. Do you know how many times over the years I've had people walk in here and say, 
well, you know, Pastor, you must be doing something wrong or you wouldn't have a church that looked like this. People always want to criticize. People take one look at the floor. Now, don't look at the floor. <laughs> but we got 135 kids in here every day eating lunch. They take one look at the floor. I had a pastor friend of mine. This is a guy I love and a guy who loves me. And he looked at me and said, Ron, if you need money for new carpet, ask me. <laughs> and my response to him was, this is new carpet. <laughs> but you see, we look at, at the outward appearance of things and we judge the effectiveness of a ministry. You've got a big new building and it's pristine and you've got no drinks in the sanctuary and it may appear like God is blessing. But I'm going to agree with the Apostle Paul. Those are rights that I'm not interested in exercising. You know, if we use the money that we use here in ministry and we decide that we had a meeting and Pastor Ken convinced me, you know, we need to get a building. With the money we spend on free ministry here at Calvary Chapel, we could have the biggest, the nicest, the most pristine sanctuary in San Antonio, Texas. Now, you know me well enough. It took me 10 years of really wrestling with Jesus to be okay with that. But I look at this sanctuary as a trophy for Jesus. And every time you walk in these doors, it's like Jesus is sort of polishing that sanctuary, that trophy, and saying, there's a group of people that really believe me. Just three ministries here at Calvary Chapel I'm not including the radio ministries. I'm not including the, the, the evangelism outreaches that we do, Joy of Jesus and others. Just three ministries. Our free school, our free doctor's office, and Manor House. Just those three ministries cost us $100,000 a month. Not a year. $100,000 a month. And what kind of building could you build? with that kind of a budget. But I think from heaven's perspective, this is far more beautiful. We did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that those who work in the temple get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the temple? Now, at this point, the cynical Corinthian, one who is sitting in defense of the Apostle Paul, is thinking, oh yeah, this is the point where he comes in and he hits us up for money. Two years ago, when we had our uh, church business meeting, we do, we do that every year, the last uh, Sunday uh, in February every year. We have a business meeting where we show you the books and we show you how, what money's come in and where it was spent and all of that and you get to ask questions, whatever. Uh, two years ago, we had a new believer in here, or not a new believer, but a, uh, somebody new to Calvary Chapel. And as I was going over the, the books and talking about how we use the money and the shortages and you know people deserve more, she wrote a note to the person who brought her. And the note that she wrote was, this is where he asks us for money. In 26 years, we've never asked you for a dime. We've never let you know what our needs are. We've never passed an offering. We've never had a building fund drive. What we've had is Jesus. What we've had is Jesus. As we get to the end of this Bible study today, I want that to be meaningful for you. Because in large part, that's because of you. Now remember the context of this whole study, chapter 8 and 9, is eating meat. 
not causing someone to stumble. Paul is simply declaring that he is willing to give up his freedom to benefit others. And that really is the Christian life. That's why those of us who call the name of Christ, we're called servants of God. The best use of Christian freedom is always throwing it away for the benefit of someone else. So he says in verse 14, in the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. Now I told you earlier that this was a legal case Paul was presenting, and he was a great lawyer. He has just persuasively proven that he should be getting support for the Corinthians. Look, you're criticizing me because I'm not taking money because I'm working with my hands. And you're right, I should be getting money from you. I've planted here in Corinth. God is harvesting the seeds that I've planted. And the work has been fruitful. So here's what he's saying. Don't I deserve now to be supported by the church? And no one could argue that he is entitled to anything and everything that he asks for. And yet after presenting and proving his case, his defense takes an unexpected turn in verse 15. But I have not used any of these rights. And I'm not writing this in the hope that you will do such things for me. I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of this boast. You see, there are some times when boasting is good and godly. This is boasting in the Lord. We get calls, questions. Uh, I get asked to speak at pastors' conferences because people want to talk about faith. And they say, well, nobody is doing this like you are, so will you talk to our people or will you talk to this group of pastors? And the answer is always yes. And it gives me a chance to boast in the Lord. I get to boast in you, but I also get to boast in the Lord. I get to boast in what God has done. It's not that we're special. It's not that, that, that we're the only ones God could trust. But I think what... Paul is saying, and what I'm going to communicate as we get to the end of this Bible study, is that when God entrusts us with something, it's a privilege and an honor. And we are going to make sacrifices for those privileges. And sometimes it's going to be really, really hard. I cannot adequately express to you how hard it has been, how many times that we've been like right on the brink of going over the edge. There's so many times I would go home and crying to Paula, poor Paula, she has to listen to all this. Paula, the church is going to close. We're not going to make it. And yet God always comes through. I remember the day that I was taking my normal morning walk with the Lord. It was very warm. I remember thinking, Lord, things are so hard. How are we ever going to make it? I, I, I'm... I'm convinced that this is what you called us to do. And there's, to my shame, been a few times when I've gotten pretty whiny with Jesus. And I said, Lord, we've, we've given everything we have. We don't have anything else of value to give. I'd give you everything, but we don't have anything else of value. You know what the Lord said to me? He said, yeah, you do. I said, no, we really don't. I actually went to a pawn shop to try to pawn a Mount Blanc pin I had from my old rich days, and they wouldn't buy it. Just so we could have a sandwich. They wouldn't buy it for anything. I said, Lord, we've given everything. There's nothing left of value. And he said, yeah, there is one thing, your truck. It was an S10 Chevy that we drove. We paid a dollar for the truck. Some people in California fixed it up, put air conditioning in it, made sure it was roadworthy, people from our old church. We drove it here, and that was the only way we'd get around. And I remember saying to the Lord, you know, Jesus, if we sell that truck, we're stuck in Texas. <laughs> See, I can connect the dots. 
And Jesus told me, you're stuck in Texas anyway because this is where I am for you. And I remember going right home. I just turned right around, went back to the apartment. And I said to Paula, I said, Paula, I think Jesus just told us to sell our truck. But I, I can't do that. I mean, what's mine is yours and yours is mine. I can't do that with, with your approval. Would you pray about it? She goes, take it. Without even thinking about it, take it. Everything that we have belongs to the Lord. Now, I don't think at that point it dawned on her quite as quickly that meant she was a Texan too. <clears throat> but the idea was, he was asking us to make a sacrifice by faith. I have the right to have a truck. I have the right to have a car. But remember what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. It is required that every man given a trust by God must prove faithful. That was our, our trust proving faithful time. And it's lasted for 26 years. And we've been at that brink so many times. And yet Jesus is always there. And we've never fallen, not even once. Do we have a right to a big sanctuary? Do we have a right to a home in the dominion? I mean, other pastors do. But to be able to say to God on that day, yeah, I had the rights for those things, but I didn't use them. No, I'm not just talking about pastors, and I think you all know that. The sacrifices God asks you to make. Now, you're part of this work of faith that we've been doing here for all these years, and God is going to ask people that are part of this ministry to make the same kind of sacrifices. Can you get to the place, will you get to the place where you will say, Jesus, no sacrifice you ask me to make is too big. I'm yours. I'm only yours. And everything that I have, everything that I am, every spare minute of my life is yours. And then can you say like Isaiah, send me? That's what Paul is doing. I've got rights. I've proven it beyond any doubt. I could do any of these things that you're criticizing me for not doing. But I didn't use these rights. He says, yet when I am, or when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast for I am compelled to preach Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel of God. Two things, and I'll move on and close. Again, this is not just for pastors. I'm compelled to preach the gospel. It's like breathing for me. But it's not just here behind this pulpit. It's where we go. The other side of that, the second thing, is that each and every one of you need to have the same heart. You've got to be compelled to share this treasure that we have in Christ. Paul says, I've got all these rights. I haven't used any of these rights because I'm doing what I have to do. I'm doing what I was born to do. I know that I'm in the perfect, pleasing, acceptable will of God every single day of my life. I know it beyond any doubt. And if you'll take this approach with the rights that you are holding on to, I promise you, you will also know that you're in the perfect will of God. And the smile of God will be poured out in heaven, and then you'll think, all I had to do was say, yes, Lord, and this is the blessing I get? He says, if I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I'm simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge and so not make use of my rights in preaching it. Now bear with me for another five minutes. It is a tragedy to me that this wonderful message that we have is so hindered because of money. We all know people who say, well, you know, I don't go to church because all they want is your money, and we've made it that way. You listen to Christian radio or Christian any other form of media, and the appeals for money 
are both endless and shameless. If you don't give to this ministry, then we won't be able to stay on the air in your area. What did God ask them to go on the air? Are they going to measure the success of proclaiming the gospel by how much money comes in? For those of you who are, and we've been active on Christian radio, I'm all over the world, our, our radio program, The Word to Stand On, that doesn't include the live program, The Word to Stand On for Life. And if you've been actively involved with Christian radio ministry, you You've noticed the programs getting shorter and shorter and the commercials within those programs getting longer and longer. Well, for your love offering of, you'll get a free book or a free journal. That's a tragedy. We're marketing the Word of God. Our programs, we get 26 minutes of airtime on every half hour program and for us a minute of that time is spent in the intro and the outro and all of the other time is simply teaching the Bible we've never asked for a dime on the radio program we've never even hinted that there is a donate button on our website why? because it's the gospel that matters it's not our needs that matter now, all of that to say this, keep us in prayer, but also I want you to be able to boast in the Lord because God is using you to be able to do these things. For those of you who have given so generously over these many years, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you because we're able to do these things and, and the Lord is pleased. It means that you are reserving rewards. Every time you serve here at Calvary Chapel, every time you give here at Calvary Chapel, and these ministries, these things that we do for free, things that no other church does no matter the size, all of these things that we do for free here, your reward register in heaven is going cha-ching. And I want you to know how pleased God is. to be a part of a work of faith like this. For every one of you individually, it means that God has something special for you. And you're not going to have to wait to heaven to get it. You're going to get rewards. But, but, but he's, he's stretching you. He's asking you to trust him. And if you'll do that, then he will lead you and guide you. He will stretch you like the old Stretch Armstrong dolls. But when it's over... <laughs> He'll be able to look out over the edge of time and space, the angels who long to look into the things concerning grace. He'll look at them and say, look at them. You mean that tacky little church in a strip mall? In San Antonio, Texas? I think of the tabernacle in the wilderness. From the outside, it looked really ordinary. It wasn't built to attract attention from thieves and bandits and opposing armies. It just looked like an old tent. But inside, the minute somebody would walk in that tabernacle inside, it was absolutely magnificent, a pattern of heaven, in fact, Bezalel. He built it. And that ordinary on the outside looking building became a magnificent monument. Now, if you were all to go out of the building and just sort of maybe stand on the other side doors and look at this building when it's empty, believe me, there's nothing special about it. But Calvary Chapel, when you walk into this building, it is every bit as beautiful and stunning and awe-inspiring as a wilderness tabernacle. Because that's what you've made it. And we're honored and privileged to be a part of it. Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you for calling us to be a part of this ministry. It's an amazing thing to consider 